Lately I've been playing a lot of PS1 Cause I find charm in the game design and low poly graphics from this era Going through such beloved classics like The OG Tekkens, Xenogears, Pepsi Man and all that But something that really caught my eye while playing through these Doesn't even have to do with the in-game assets <laughs> Instead, I'm talking about the pre-rendered CG cutscenes and openings The full motion videos that look better than anything that was rendered in real time you may call these early 3D models and animations shitty or awkward or whatever. I guess it varies in some ways better than others, but I feel like there's this unique look and feel to them that will never be replicated. The PS1 was the console that popularized these, and damn I'd say it has the most iconic ones. But first, let me explain how these are made. Alright, so back when the PS1 dropped, one of its cool new features was the ability to store video files on the CD-ROMs it used. This meant that cutscenes weren't limited to real-time assets, and developers could instead animate and pre-render these sequences on much more powerful computers, creating a video file that the PS1 would just play back. The way these movies were used was to further immerse you in the world, by showing characters, props, and environments in a much higher detail than the PS1 itself was capable of. Basically, it lets you better see how the creators envisioned it, especially when the end game models were much more limited. Yeah, yeah, we've heard no jokes about Cloud's who forms already. The kids nowadays are laughing at Law shitting his pants, along with the rest of the gorgeous expressions that Tekken 1 gave us. The jump to 3D console gaming was full of wonder and awe, and these FMVs that utilize the quickly evolving computer graphics technology allowed people to see a glimpse of what was yet to come. You can see why this was a huge selling point back in the day. It's kind of like you get rewarded with this awesome captivating cinematic for progressing through a game's story. And it's why it was so exciting to unlock a character's ending in the fine game that featured them. Probably the FMVs that most people will remember though are those crazy ass intros and openings. And some of them are so good that you better not skip that shit in this house. Some PS1 games opted to use live action or traditional animation for their FMVs instead. But I want to focus specifically on the ones using pre-rendered CG. And uh, late disclaimer, do keep in mind that all these games are running through emulation since my bum ass can't afford the original hardware. And beyond that, these FMVs will always look better on the display that they were originally designed for. But anyways, why am I talking about this? Is it cause I find it fascinating to see what was considered a technical marvel back in the day and the art that came from developers getting creative and working around the limitations of that new technology so they could push the boundaries and achieve their vision? Nah, actually, I just really like that glossy look and certain aesthetic these FMVs had. Cause I don't know man, they just look so different and wondrous in a way. And although I wasn't around to experience being wild by them, it still manages to make me feel nostalgic for an era that I wasn't even alive in. The lower level of detail and flow to your physics give it this dreamlike atmosphere. Yeah, I think that's the best way I could put it. Some had unconventional movement, some were made up of basic shapes and textures, some had only one light source, but even the more advanced ones had that same distinct look to them. Like, I wish I could describe it better, but I have a limited vocabulary and stuff, so. I just feel like these FMVs give your brain just enough to work with. They paint a solid enough picture of how these worlds and their scenes play out, but are still simplistic enough that you kinda have to use your imagination to fill in the finer details, if you know what I mean. Like just from CG alone, I wonder what material Jin's gi pants are. He's not really running around in those cardboard trousers held up by that shoelace ass string. Squall was a broody ass teenager bro, I bet he had some acne on his face. There's no way he had smooth skin like that, shit like that. Computer animation was still in its early days during the start of the 32-bit era, so animators and engineers were still learning the ways of a new medium. You can tell the earlier you go in this lifespan, with titles like Star Gladiator, where Hayato tries to flex his plasma sword wielding skills, and this boy is stiff as shit. Or Tekken 1, where Yoshi drops some bills around martial laws in the neighborhood, and the way he opens his mouth in excitement looks like he's about to gobble up a mean glizzy. Even Final Fantasy VII can look rough, I guess, but that didn't stop them from doing the most with Tifa in this one scene. It just looks so silly, bruh. The technology quickly improved towards the late 90s though, especially with high budget titles, and you can see this clearly with Square's next biggest release. 
the one I'm showing to you now. Just two years later, Lil Timothy must have been shitting his pants when he saw this on the Pizza Hut demo disc. Then two years more, and Final Fantasy X's pre-render cutscenes look like this. Pretty nutty. Squaresoft really was the undisputed king when it came to these. And by this point they are using motion capture technology, where I think it best shines in this scene right here, the Watch for the Moon. I really like the choreography here, the performers did a great job conveying the awkward moments, and the dance itself is so fluid. The PS1 Final Fantasies didn't have any voice acting, even during these FMVs, but the expressions and body language alone were enough to bring these scenes to life. The transitions into FMVs were also pretty smooth in this game. And sometimes you would even control the characters over one playing in the back. Alright, maybe because the models are up res, this shit looks like two actors running in front of a green screen, but... Eh, it don't matter. The illusion was lost on us anyways. Final Fantasy VIII was full of these gorgeous cutscenes, but the one that everyone points to in particular, even the people that dog on this game, is the grandiose opening cinematic. It begins with the calm, soothing sound of a beach shoreline. The choir steadily kicks into what is definitely Wevo and Matsu's greatest pieces he's ever composed. There's a reason they played the shit at the Olympics. These enigmatic words just pop up, the shot zooms past a few other environments, and it gives us a glimpse of Squall and Renoa, all while the orchestra increases in intensity. Renoa is seen standing alone, waiting for someone in this vast open field. She catches a flower petal with her hand and lets go of a white feather that flies up into a clear blue sky with this smoothly transitioning into a gun blade that drops down from the dark clouds, right where Squall and Cypher are dueling. We get a view of the source of Zedea, who the game sets up as a main threat. Then Cypher chief shots Squall like the bitch he is, slashing his face as he's on the ground, but Squall quickly retaliates with a swing of his own, giving him an identical wound, as if the way they marry each other wasn't symbolic enough. All that striking imagery, a banger of a fucking theme, but right after the big battle where it seemed like just about everything was on the line. You find out that it was really just a petty scrap between two classmates, and you're just an emo ass child soldier stuck in some preppy military academy where everyone obsesses over this goofy ass card game. This card game is actually some gas though. As for why the Watch for the Moon is my favorite PS1 FMV, there's no profound reason I can give you really, I just think it's pretty cute. Just don't pause and stare at the faces for too long. You might get some sort of uncanny valley vibes. But hey, that's fine. Cause ironically, I think some games cutscenes benefit from the off-putting nature that could come from these outdated models. And in turn, makes them more unsettling with time. The best example I could give you is Parasite Eve. Squaresoft's interesting survival horror RPG set during the week of Christmas, 1997. A sequel to the original science fiction horror novel, it stars a New York City cop named Aya Brea. So to get to the point, the infamous opera scene that the story opens up with is one that left a lasting impression on many people back when it was first released. I know this cause when I asked a few of my old heads who had a PS1, which cutscenes they found the most memorable, they pretty much all mentioned Parasite Eve, and this scene in particular. First you got that uncanny valley shit I was talking about, I don't like the way this lady's face moves whenever she does her solo. But maybe that observation comes from looking at it in retrospect. Nah, what's really disturbing is how she causes everyone in the crowd to just burst into flames through spontaneous combustion. She does this through cell manipulation, explained by real life science like... Like the... Um... I don't know bruh. Once you start using too many five-syllable words, anything you say just goes over my head. But anyways, seeing the shock in the eyes of these now poor imitations of humans, along with those screams from hell and the doll-like movements they exhibit, it's pretty eerie to me, homie. Parasite Eve was pretty on point with its heavy use of disgusting body horror. Don't even get me started with the Central Park concert or that gross-ass rat transformation. They were even more detailed in the sequel, thanks to it being a 2000 release. This one right here is the most infamous one, but I'm not gonna do you like that and show it. Watch them on your own if you want. But what I really like about Parasite Eve is that I can finally justify learning that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Since I'm already talking about the use of FMVs in the PS1 survival horror game, I may as well bring up the one that everyone and their moms know.
Resident Evil 1 mostly used those campy live action cutscenes, which we all know are extremely memorable because of how corny they were. But tell me that the iconic first encounter would have hit the same had we not been shown this close up, slow and detailed head turn of the zombie. Boo! For the sequel, they got help from professional screenwriter Noburo Sigimura and director Hideki Kamiya and his team went for a much more Hollywood blockbuster approach and it immediately gives off that vibe with the intro. I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? The suspenseful score, the sound effects, the way the shots are framed. <laughs> the cheesy dialogue. Wait, don't shoot! Get down! We can't stay out here. Head to the police station. It'll be a lot safer. Some things can also look pretty goofy in retrospect that weren't originally intended to. Like remember when that one zombie pops up from the backseat of Leon's car? After deciding to just be perfectly quiet and politely waiting for them to both finish their dialogue? <laughs> we should probably give him the benefit of a doubt though. I'm sure he was eating fries off the floor or something. But yeah, the fact that he's clearly just an altered model of Leon and the way he yeets out the windshield in slow motion like this will never not be hilarious to me bro. You okay? Still in one piece. <gasps> the FMVs looked even better in 3. The opening was dramatic, the zombies were more detailed, and Brad's death was probably the most convincing one yet. Brad! We've got a... My favorite one is when Jill finally manages to contact an evac to escape Raccoon City and then she gets to the top of the clock tower with this wonderful Disney ass music playing in the back like It's finally over And the bioweapon that's hunting her down, Nemesis, just pulls up out of nowhere and blasts the chopper down I don't know why but it feels a bit surreal to me how fast it switches up from the feel good energy to Ah oh, shit, he's back at it again Nemesis clearly understands comedic timing and he never ever looked better than he did in these cutscenes in my opinion. He's always carrying a rocket launcher like he's from Chicago. So you know he's on Demon Time 24-7. When it comes to PS1 survival horror games, Silent Hill's FMVs are definitely my favorite though. Half because of how strangely beautiful they are, and half because of the story behind them. When the game first released, some people were getting filtered by the fog, some thought the story was some cheeks, they couldn't keep up with the junkies, hallucinations, cult rituals and shit. But the fantastic CG cutscenes were universally praised by everyone and it's all the more impressive once you find out that they are solely made by one man. Down to the facial expressions. After Takayoshi Sato was hired at Konami, he saw where the gaming industry was headed and so he decided to teach himself how to animate and model in 3D. That alone deserves props. Yet still when he would teach his superiors the technology, they would just take credit for all his work. So essentially, what he did was put his dick on the table, said alright fuck you wrinkly bastards, if y'all don't let me do my magic on a larger project under my name, I'm out this bitch and I'm taking my expertise with me. They agreed and let him do Silent Hill's cutscenes all by himself and it took him two years to complete. And he would just sleep under his desk, probably getting roasted under that hot ass rendering hardware while everyone else was out partying and seeing their families. You get me bro? This man single handedly carried the game's marketing and put himself through hell for this and he still took the time to make some silly bloopers on the side. Alright, I'm gonna talk about the ones in fine games now. No segue or anything, I'm gonna just do it. Let's start with the most slept on PS1 fine game intro. It's easily Soul Blade or Soul Edge or Soul Goon, or whatever they call the PS1 poor in your area. It had this pretty charming opening backed by its iconic theme song that really gets off that English dub anime intro energy. You might recognize this banger from somewhere actually. It may seem a bit silly the first time you hear it, thinking that it's an odd choice given the game's setting, but it's just so damn catchy, and the accompanying visuals are also quite nice. Most of the characters show a ton of personality, as well as their own motivations for seeking the legendary Soul Edge. 
Everything is well animated. The pacing and use of the theme song is immaculate. It's just, it's just peak cinema. Clearly, Namco had the fighting game openings unlocked during this generation. And you know where I'm going with this, right? Easy victory. We can acknowledge Tekken One's innovation for its time, but we can skip it since there's just not much to say. You've probably seen anything we're talking about as a meme already. Tekken 2's console opening though, a goddamn masterpiece. It opens with Heihachi climbing back up from the same cliff Kazuya had chucked him off of. At the end of the first tournament, the atmosphere in this opening just perfectly sets up for this game's darker tone and gorgeous aesthetic. Cause what proceeds to play is this 80s ass dance funk, lady whispering in the back, synth and piano pop, I don't even know what it is. All you need to know is that's an incredible composition, and the beat switch when it gets Nina singing in the club is godlike. Now that we look at it, it seems like she's balding cause her hair looks thin as hell, but back in 96, this was just Namco flexing. So let's have a moment of silence for those who put in the man hours to complete this masterpiece for the world to see. A's action movie vibes. We get a brief moment with each character on the starting roster, but the one that stands out to me the most is King's introduction. He's at rock bottom, just absolutely wasted in this alleyway. It's cause the orphanage under his care is struggling, and them robux ain't cheap, you know. And just around the corner comes his old rival Armor King, who throws him his mask and tells him to get his shit together. It's only 7 seconds, but it hits hard when even your enemies have to come and drag you out of depression. Then we see Kazuya has become a corrupt and powerful man, looking down from the top of his tower in contrast to Heihachi this time around. Now it leaves us ruined for the lesser of two evils. This is the only time you'll see me riding for someone that kicks a 5 year old in the fucking chest. Probably. Finally, comes his last brilliant shot of Kazuya being held by Angel. The camera pans away from his bloodshot eyes and face a Heihachi rising up for vengeance. <whistles> like damn, what even happened to Tekken intros? They kinda fell off. Unless Tekken 8 proves me wrong. <laughs> These openings really were a technological showcase for how rapidly computer graphics were advancing in the 90s and early 2000s. I mean, just take a look at the massive leap between these two renders of Heihachi. They're only three years apart. Yup, the second one is Tekken 3, and graphically, it's opening dunks on 2 any day. It's also stupid iconic. Does it get more late 90s than this? <laughs> Yo, that part where King is doing his reps under AK supervision, then comes dashing out to face the crowd, will be hype as hell forever. Come back and watch me talk about the rest of it in a few years if I'm still around though. Cause Tekken can't have all the shine. But wait, shout out to the arcade run endings, the best implementation of FMVs. That ancient ogre boss was nothing, but the way Devil Cause read your inputs was a violation of my goddamn sanity, so you best believe I'm going to savor every second of those cutscenes. Plus, that's just how you'll find out more about these characters and see if they would achieve their goals. Cause I need to find out why Gon rips ass, and the manual ain't gonna tell me that. The most prominent 3D fighters usually had CG openings or endings. The first Bloody Roar and Bushido Blades pre-rendered graphics were pretty primitive, but the sequels definitely stepped it up. Bloody Roar 2's intro is a classic, and Shield Blade 2 was on that old school samurai movie shit. Dead or Alive got this intro showcasing its characters, backed by this smooth killer bass and I want to talk about Arika Street Fighter EX Plus Alpha real quick. Go ahead fool. Laugh all you want at these crappy graphics, but I think they're pretty cute. They kinda look like action figures, especially in my boy Skull Mania. Like Tekken 1, the character endings had the exact same song, no matter if it matched the visuals, but it's just way too goofy and feel good for me to ever find annoying. Sakura was the last character added with the port, so I wonder if that has anything to do with her endings animation being smoother than the rest. Eh, don't matter, cause the standout is still Zangis. This crazy bastard has mastered the art of the Russian squad, as you can see. SNK also gave it a shot at giving a traditionally 2D fighter some 3D graphics with the console port of Fatal Fury, Wild Ambition. It's a retelling of the OG Fatal Fury and has this awesome lengthy prologue in the style of a crime film. The most important detail is that we can see Terry has the exact same fashion sense as when he was 8 years old. I don't think anybody is surprised by it though. Although the events are slightly different from the original, we see Terry and Andy's origin story rendered in 3D. It shows their father Jeff coming outside and picking up Terry's hat that he dropped, 
Just chilling on this fine Wednesday afternoon, taking in all the fumes and admiring the view of the concrete jungle that is South Town. When all of a sudden, his old spiteful pal Geese Howard just pulls up and straight delivers him that two piece combo. No words exchanged and some soy sauce with it. That's putting it lightly. This dude just murders him with his bare fist. Terry comes back to see what has transpired and vows his revenge on Geese, dedicating himself to becoming a great warrior who will eventually confront him. And we all know how that goes. The character designer for Dream Factory's Toll Ball number one was the GOAT Akira Toriyama, and I swear there was an old Dragon Ball Z game that looked just like this. Nonetheless, I always felt like these designs of his were underrated, and the Japanese exclusive sequel did them further justice with its updated visuals. I know, I know, 80% of this video is pretty much a square soft, but like, what did you expect? After a monumental success of Final Fantasy VII, they had a shitload of money to fund their array into multiple other genres, and knew how impactful the eye candy of a CG intro could be. My favorite one of these projects is Air Guides. All oh, my beloved Air Guides. That game you know cause Cloud, Sephiroth, Tifa, and other Final Fantasy VII characters were playable. The opening is action packed, with the Air Guides blimp coming crashing through the entire city, along with the dramatic introductions of the wacky and weird characters that Nomura drew up. Should go watch it. It's awesome, but it's also kinda eerie in a way. Now don't beat me up, but I haven't played Final Fantasy IX yet, even though everyone tells me it's like the best one. I have seen the Coca-Cola commercial though, and it really does a good job of matching the art style and feeling of that game's cutscenes. Yup, everyone knows about the Coca Lab they had during Y2K, right? What about when they poured the previous Final Fantasies to the PS1? Abysmal loading times aside, they also got brand new openings and endings. And it's notable because it gave these characters and worlds their 3D debuts and chances to shine under that classic Squaresoft CG. Whereas Final Fantasy 7 and 8 CG models were based on Tetsuya Nomura's art, these ones brought Yoshitaka Amano's iconic art style to 3D over 20 years before Fortnite did. And it looks really pretty. The androgynous looking people strike a nice balance between stylization and realism, and I think it helped it age well. I don't even think they had to be visually impressive to help elevate a game's atmosphere though. They can actually be pretty shitty. Case in point, Philemon in the first persona, the divine being that bestows upon you the power to wield personas. He appears in a dreamlike state, and look, I know the localized version of this game is pretty ass, but hear me out. Because of the primitive 3D and how stiff Philemon moves during these cutscenes, it really does give him an otherworldly feel, and I feel like his English voice complements it well. I live between the world of consciousness and unconsciousness. So tell me, who are you? As is like all commanding energy to it. I'm looking for a word. If this dude walked into a McDonald's and started ordering, everyone in the establishment would turn around immediately and be like, who the fuck is that? You know what? I'm not even going to pretend that this video essay even has a real thesis anymore. I'm just going to point out whether I find cool about some more PS1 FMVs. Water. Here it is. Xenogears. Everyone knows what Xenogears is. Xenogears. <laughs> A classic game with interesting thought provoking themes of religion, psychology, just look at this crucified Furby. Shit's wild dog. Honestly, this game is pretty fire, but it makes me think too hard and I don't like that shit. Being ignorant is what keeps me happy. The game featured these trippy high quality 90s anime cutscenes, but it did have a few CG ones, which I do find aesthetically pleasing. Like this one right here, it's just something about the simplistic mall and color contrast of the gear over the vast desert landscape that looks wonderful to me. The mechas in PS1 FMVs look pretty cool. Like Armor Core, Front Mission, even the people that made Gran Turismo made one called Omega Boost, and nobody even talks about it anymore. And yeah, Gran Turismo is cool, but everyone knows Ridge Racer is where it's at, especially Type 4. I swear, this whole game's aesthetic is sublime, and the soundtrack is absolutely timeless. It's got that neo soul, acid jazz, house, drum and bass, some really good shit that you had to hear, 
In the intro, the intro is quite the vibe. It starts in the apartment of the series' mascot, the race queen Reiko. You've probably seen her on the cover of those PS1 Jungle Mix videos. They're cool, but they need some more ape escape in that bitch. But anyways, she's headed to work, and the stereo is bumping this absolute house banger with these amazing vocals from the talented Kimara Lovelace. The way it cuts between her commute and the street race with the pacing of the song is super duper clean. For some reason, she's walking like 100 miles outside the city to get to her destination, and one of her heels snap. Ah, oh, hell nah, lady. Whatever they're paying you, it ain't enough. She hitches a ride with the dude who's in the lead, lets out the biggest cheese you've ever seen, and he still has enough time to come in that first place, so that was hella smooth. Who cares about what's happening though? Cause the jams in this game are like, God damn, I can't even describe it. Kota Takahashi was cooking fierce when he made this shit. I know it can be annoying when people say they didn't have to go that hard with the music. Like, bro, yes they did. That's your fucking job. But if Type 4 wasn't the fine driving simulator it is, then I could easily see the music outlasting the game. And yup, I've lost the point of this video. It's time to wrap it up. Apart from being a celebration of PS1 FMVs, I guess what I want to convey through all this is that I think the pre-rendered 3D cutscenes from this era are a pretty nice novelty to look back on. And yeah, we can point and laugh at them because of how weird and jank some may look to our spoiled eyes today. But I believe they can still be appreciated because of that genuinely distinct and charming look that came from those technological limitations. It's just fascinating, dog. I couldn't find a video that really talks about them like that. So I decided to make it myself type shit. I may have gone too lost in the sauce during the process of it though. So yeah, video essays are for chumps. I'm going back to making fine game retrospectives and I've already planned out my next several ones. So let's see how it goes. I really want to be more consistent too cause only dropping like 3 videos a year is pretty whack. But who knows, I'm a very incompetent person. Let me know if this video is ass or not. And thank you so much for taking the time to watch it. Peace.